Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Model Guy. And in this episode, I'm going to be building Arma's 148 P39 Air Cobra. Last year, I built Arma's 148 Hurricane release and absolutely loved it. That had been a build with zero speed bumps, very easy to get together, and turned into a very nice model once completed. This P39, on the other hand, wasn't without a few speed bumps. If you've been following this channel for any length of time, you know that I have no problems being honest about kits, especially when they're difficult or they're not up to par. Arma announced earlier this year that they went to a new company to produce their molds and tooling for this kit, and unfortunately, that's where the majority of the fit issues with this kit seem to come from. While the engineering looks solid on the CAD work and in the instructions, it simply comes down to a lot of the parts do not fit. As a quick review of this kit, I found myself removing most of the locating pins and sanding down locating pins as well to get parts to fit properly. In fact, when doing the math, I believe I removed about 80% of the locating pins for this kit alone, just to get everything to line up nicely. In the end, it does build into a nice model, but it's a little bit of a journey to get there. You're going to notice during this video that all of a sudden all the pieces go back into plain styrene and the process almost starts again. And the reason for that is I'd made the mistake initially of thinking this kit would go together as well as the Hurricane. Even with the 3D printed parts you get a file for when you go on Arma's website and print it off, those weren't the issue. One of the biggest issues with this kit was trying to get the nose to close properly. Even when test fitting, I had about a 2mm gap on the bottom that I couldn't get closed without a lot of force. So what ended up happening is I had to start taking pieces of the kit apart to try to diagnose why things weren't fitting downstream. And in the end, it became easier for me just to buy another kit and start assembly again from scratch. This time really paying attention to the fit of every single piece before committing to glue. And it was a little bit of an eye-opening experience the second time around for the things that I had missed. Going back through the footage to do this video, it should have been some flags right away, like this rear bulkhead not fully seating, that there was going to be some more problems downstream. And I'll show you those as I get there. And even the forward firewall doesn't really have anywhere as positive that it locates. It just sits there and you sort of have to eyeball it. The second time around building the kit, I used the side fuselage as a jig to make sure everything had lined up properly. Here you can see where the first attempt at the kit stopped. I even removed that prop shaft just to see if that was what was causing the interference, but it wasn't. For some reason, the sides of the fuselages were pushing apart and I couldn't get them to close back together. Upon diagnosis, it turned out that the tabs for locating that plate holding the ball bearings was too wide and causing the problems. So now you're going to see where the second kit comes into play and I revisit all these issues. Another big challenge of this kit was trying to get these inlets to line up properly, but it turns out by cutting away all the locating tabs in the wings, I was able to get them to sit more flush, but I did have to remove the shoulders of that rear bulkhead for the nose gear bay to get things to sit properly. So here you can see there's quite the gap. Coming in with the side cutters, I simply removed this fillet and that allowed the wing to sit much lower and cleaner than before. While building this kit, I spoke with some other people I knew who were building this exact same version, and they were also running into a lot of the same issues. So it was really going to be beneficial for me to take the time to try to find all these causes to save this time for some other people. Here you can see the fit is much nicer after removing the fillets, and the wing sits right in place. My next step was to take a file and remove the locating tabs for the pan that holds the weights in the nose. And I removed these completely, that way they didn't push the fuselage halves away from each other. The same with the floor pan in the cockpit. I also removed about a half millimeter from each of the locating tabs so this would sit flush. All these things I missed the first time around because it looks like it's that close, but it actually isn't fitting properly. Now that I had figured out a lot of the fit issues of the kit, the creative juices started to flow again and I decided to improve the look of the pan where the radio sits. In Soviet Lend-Lease aircraft, the radios were removed, leaving a gap where you should see some radio cables and mounts. But Arma didn't include that, so a few minutes of scratch building with some brass tube and styrene fixed that problem. All of this was done just to add some visual interest to an otherwise 
empty area on the kit. For drilling the holes, I simply used my micrometer to make sure that the drill bit size matched the brass tube size and gave you a nice clean installation. That way I didn't have a big gap sitting around the pipe. Remember to measure twice and cut once. Once the brass tubes slash bungs were in place, it was then time to use some lead wire to simulate the leads leading to the radio. Now is this 100% accurate? Not at all. This is what we would call greeblies just to make it look better. One interesting thing that Arma has been doing is instead of releasing a kit that has all the 3D parts included that some people might not want to use, they simply make the files available online either for purchase at a small cost or as a bonus part to the kit from the instructions. That's nice for those of us that have 3D printers that want to add a little bit more detail to the kit. To make the doors fit a little bit better in the open position, I used a chisel to remove part of the hinge that way it looked like it was actually folding outwards. Because Arm is going to do several variants off this fuselage, you do need to cover up some of the panels that are not included in the Q variant. In order to get the radio floor to sit properly and not push the fuselage sides apart, you do have to remove quite a bit of the tabs on the fuselage halves to prevent that. Then on that note, it was time to move back into paint. Curtis Aircraft use a lot of different interior colors during the war, so make sure you check your references. Remember that rear bulkhead that didn't want to sit flush? It turns out if you move the lower part of the trim here, about 2-3 to three millimeters, you can actually get this to sit very nicely. This was done with just a hobby knife and then scraping it to set it flush. This allows the bulkhead to fully seat in position. You've also probably noticed by now in this episode that I'm not doing the history of the aircraft. And I think it was more important in this episode to focus more on the build and the challenges people are going to have with the kit. So that means we're going to have to revisit the P-39 again down the road. Overall, when it comes to this kit and looking at it, why I had all these fitment issues and challenges, it looks like when they did the tooling that it wasn't as precise as it needed to be. Most of the pins, locating pins and tabs looked like they had swelled or bloomed a little bit, so they didn't fit properly. The best way to explain the challenges you're going to have is think of an airfix kit from the early 90s where they had a lot of these same problems as well. I'm sure there's going to be some comments in the comment section below telling me that I'm not a real modeler or that I should go to building Lego, but at the end of the day, a model kit for me is something I want to sit and enjoy and build. Do I expect everything to be drop fit and Tamiya like in engineering? No, I don't expect that. I don't mind the small corrections here and there to get fits to be proper, but I don't expect an entire kit to be like that. I'm not Paul Budznick. I'm not building things from scratch. I work in a job where I'm working on machinery and equipment all day, and when I come home, I want to relax and not feel like I'm still at work. The big question during this build I had was, would I build this kit again? For the first few days on the first kit, I definitely did not want to visit it again. But after seeing that some people were having problems as well, and it wasn't just me, I decided to buy the whole kit and start it again. And having solved most of these little problems, I'm going to ask myself, would I build this kit again? And the answer is yes. I do like the P39, and I do like how the final build looks. So I would definitely do it again, but not tomorrow. Another question I get asked too is would I recommend this kit for a brand new or novice builder using my 10 year old son as the gauge for that? And I'm going to say no. You are going to have to put in some work here, do a little bit of troubleshooting, wiggle your tongue, do some sanding and quote unquote fundamental modeling skills. But you can get a very nice build in the end. But this is something that's going to take a little bit of patience and some test fitting for. If you're someone who enjoys Tamiya or Kutari builds, this kit's gonna challenge you. That's also not to say that a lot of these problems I had were caused by myself not really test fitting along the way and assuming I was gonna have really good fits. So a big part of that is on me as well. When fitting the horizontal and vertical stabilizers, it was back to scratching my head trying to figure out why these pieces weren't sitting properly. And then again, I found myself removing large sections of the locating tabs and sanding them down to get the proper fit. To me, a proper fit means something that's going together with minimal cleanup required afterwards. You may have noticed during this build that I'm using Zappagap super glue to fill holes instead of my usual sprue goo. 
The reason for that, I've noticed my sprue goo has been shrinking a little bit over time, causing problems on another build I'm doing as well. So having talked to some of the guys I met in Denver, they highly recommended using super goo to fill these holes. I know I've been preaching sprue goo because it actually welds to the styrene plastic it's on, but the super glue just dries quicker and it's a little bit easier to work with in the short term. And being a review build, I didn't want to have to come back in and fill some ghost seams at the end of this build. That also highlights a problem with some modelers as they get set in their own ways and they don't want to change their processes and they believe that how they do things is the only way to do it. So don't be afraid to try new things. Just for a conclusion on the vertical stabilizer here, you're going to have to thin out that locating tab quite a bit to get it to sit cleanly in place. But if you take your time doing it, you won't even have to re-scribe anything. It'll sit and have a nice little panel line there when you're done. If this video is going to teach you anything about the world of modeling, it's to always test fit, test fit, test fit, no matter the brand and no matter the model. Another small improvement I made in the look of the kit was to drill out the shrouds that cover the machine gun barrels. And this was done with some PCB drill bits and gradually stepping up in size. Anytime you do any drilling, you should always start with a small guide hole and then gradually increase the size. If you go to the biggest drill right away, there's a chance you may split the plastic. One funny moment building this kit was when I finished it and put up the final photos is I had someone tell me that I had the wrong door open on the aircraft and they were adamant that pilots never use the port side door to enter the aircraft. That this mature person told me that their father, their grandfather, or whoever had flown and worked on P-39s and that they always used the starboard door. Unfortunately for him, I had several reference photos of both U.S. and Soviet pilots posing by that port side door. It never ceases to amaze me how agitated modelers can get when it comes to these small points. Especially when they double down when you're showing them reference photos that state otherwise. Just when I thought I was out of the woods, the exhaust stacks also needed their locating tabs removed and cleaned up in order to fit properly. But at this point, I realized that there wasn't anything going on with the kit I couldn't solve, and it inspired me to take the time to drill out those exhaust stacks as well to make them look a little bit nicer. Before doing any drilling, I usually use a needle and a pin vise to mark my center point and then use the smallest drill bit working out to the largest ones. It takes a little bit of time, but in the end it's worth the effort. You definitely want to use something as a center punch though, because there's a big risk that you'll damage the part if you try doing this freehand. Armid does provide masks for the outside of the canopy and the insides of the doors, and that makes life a lot easier when it comes to painting. After priming the kit with Mr. Surfacer 1500 Grey, it was time to move into some colors, and that's when things start to get exciting on a kit. I had chosen to do the Soviet Lend-Lease P39 in the kit because it was going to open itself up to some awesome weathering techniques with the paint. And I was going to use this as a sort of test mule to try really fading out some olive drab. When it comes to replicating weathered paint, I don't think any other technique is quite as versatile as sandwich shading. And the whole idea here is you're using very vibrant colors, different from the main base color, to really push the different tone depths and variation in the paint. That's not to say you can't do the same effect later with an oil dot filter, but it's a little bit faster I find and it's easier to fix. For more information on this technique, and if it's something you want to try out yourself, definitely reference Doog's models with a G. He's one of the pioneers of this and really pushes the boundaries of what you can and can't do with it. He also provides some great examples for navy colors, for blacks, for greens, Southeast Asia, navy, etc. Definitely check him out. He's worth the subscribe. One of the more fun colors to work with is olive drab, and that's because there's so many different things that can happen with it as it's wearing. My process with sandwich shading is to lay down the lightest color first. This is what the olive drab is going to ultimately fade to in the end. So all my other paints are going to build up on top of this. 
The next color I'm going to lay down is some reddish brown. And the idea here is to start messing with the olive drab. When you try to blend on top of this, you're going to get some really weird effects, which in the end works out. So trust this process. This turns out to be the best color due to some pre-shading within some small areas. Pre-shading itself has its place, but I don't want the aircraft to look uniform with the fading and weathering. This reddish brown is one of the best colors to replicate the worst areas for grime and wear on the aircraft. Moving into a color now you might be more familiar with, I'd put down some zinc chromate in the areas that the ground crew would be walking on and stripping away the paint. Because the olive drab is gonna have more wear in this area, the blend coat is gonna be a lot thinner, so I can't have the red on top of the yellow, otherwise it's gonna take a lot more paint to cover and I'm gonna lose that yellow. Now I move on to the meat of the sandwich shading sandwich, and here I'm laying down a very thin blend coat of olive drab, just to see how all this weathering is working so far. What you should pay attention to here is that this color is not meant to blend the colors underneath the same way as the final coat. One thing I noticed on colored P-39 reference photos is that the areas where the fuel tank sat were generally darker and a more bluish tint than the rest of the paint around it. So to set this with the sandwich shading, I used some field blue. And the beautiful thing about sandwich shading is if you're not happy with something, you can push it back a little bit with the next layer. My next step was to use some faded olive drab from AK for the control surfaces and the leading edge of the wing. And I wasn't a big fan of how it looked on the leading edge, so I ended up pushing this back a little bit with the next blend layer. The effect was a little too drastic and kind of jarring when I pulled the tape off. For painting out the US markings, I used some RLM green, and now I was ready for my final, final blend coat. This mask was used with a compass cutter and a ruler and a hobby knife. Before I could move on to the final blend coat, I found another colored photo of a P-39 that showed that same effect from the fuel tanks where the engine sits in the fuselage. That photo also showed some more areas where the leaks and grime were more prominent. I imagine a lot of this is from cleaning the cannon and guns in the nose. Now it was time to come back with the Mr. Color Olive Drab and lightly blend everything down. Another odd area I found on the color photo of the P-39 was this almost orangey area above the exhaust. So to do that, I simply mixed up some light orange paint as a filter and sprayed that down. Now it was time to unmask that tail stripe and I was pretty happy with the final result there. And now it was time to move into decals. The nice thing about Arma kits is they use cartograph decals, so they're very predictable on how they'll go down. The only problem I really had with this kit, Steckles, is when I did the no walk lines that were red, there was a lot of carrier film on those and I ended up getting some silvering. But after a gloss coat and some sanding, I was able to get rid of those. I should also mention at this point, it's a bit of a fluke that I've done two Soviet vehicles back to back. The big thing about doing a Soviet aircraft is it opened itself up to a lot of weathering opportunities that a stateside P-39 would not have. One final upgrade I made to the kit was to drill out the barrel of the cannon in the nose that was a prominent feature on the P-39. Once that was glued into place on the spinner, it was time to move into flat coating everything before oils. Here you'll see that silvering in the no walk decals, and next time I do this kit, I'll use the thinner decals provided. I just wanted to see how these would go down, and I suspected that I would get a little bit of silvering in that big carrier film area, so I'm not really surprised. My flat coat of choice has always been to me as flat clear. The pin wash underneath was made with some Abtalung 502 oil paint and enamel thinner, and thin down till it ran freely down the side of my palette. 
I used the same mix for the top of the aircraft because it worked really well with that olive drab. Then it was time to remove all of the masking on the canopy. With that port side door loosely glued in place, I ended up with some dust on the inside of the canopy that I used a Q-tip to clean out. Then the exhaust was simply done with some Tamiya buff and lightly applied to build up that effect. And that will bring this build to a close. Once again, I would like to thank Arma for providing this kit for your review sample. I hope this met your expectations, and I hope for anyone else building this kit, it's given you an idea of what speed bumps you can expect and how to easily work around those. All in all, this does turn into a very nice P39 kit when you're done. Just be ready to do a little bit of work to get there. If you haven't already, make sure you click that subscribe button and leave a like for the video. If you haven't liked this video, let me know why in the comment section below. This is The Model Guy, and I will see you next time. And we'll be getting back into an airfix kit, but more on that later. You can also follow me on Instagram and Facebook as Robbie The Model Guy. That's it for now. See you later.